Yeah, good morning, um, everybody. Um, I too um, would like to thank by uh, to acknowledge uh, the Larrakia uh, traditional owners of Darwin. And I would also like to um, thank uh, Billawara Lee for her very um, warm welcome yesterday. I would also like to acknowledge the uh, Binning Gunwok traditional owners of Western Arnhem Land, with whom I've collaborated for over 40 years. Some of my collaborators are here today, uh, but sadly too many are now deceased prematurely from preventable diseases. I want to disclose at the outset that I am a director of Garagat Ganji Trust, or KKT, that works with a number of ranger groups uh, here, as well as with Alpha NT Limited. And I also want to acknowledge that I'm a director of Original Power uh, that sponsors the First Nations Clean Energy Network. So, everything I'm saying today is uh, my independent viewpoint. It doesn't reflect the views of those organisations. In just a few moments, I want to look at the macro policy situation, uh, the big uh, picture uh, in this space. I'll be focusing on remote Australia, 86% of the continent, um, or an area of six million square kilometres. Um, I'm not uh, going to focus on states or territories, but on that remote region where the latest uh, census tells us from 2021 that there are about 160,000 First Nations people living in that space. In May 2022, uh, just nine months ago yesterday, uh, Australia elected a new federal government. Suddenly, after a decade of silence, we could talk openly about and address the climate crisis and the environmental crisis in this country. The new government quickly made laws to decarbonise, 43% by 2030, net zero by 2050. The government as we've already heard, did some very positive things in quick succession. Uh, it responded to the heritage desecration at the Duke, Duke and Gorge and committed to stronger um, heritage protection laws. It um, responded to the Samuel Review of the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Security Act and the State of the Environment Report 2021 with a nature positive plan that was um, expanded uh, after COP15 in December last year uh, to a commitment to expand the Australian conservation estate to 30% of the continent from the current 20%. By 2030, there will be somewhere between 19 and 29 additional Indigenous protected areas, which will um, enhance the 81 current IPAs that currently constitute more than 50% of Australia's conservation estate or the National Reserve System. And most of the expansion that will come, that 10%, will be Indigenous titled land. Um, the Australian government uh, committed to the independent review of ACCUs and the ERF that we've heard a lot about. All these responses are very positive. They recognise First Nation people's contributions. And I think um, it's really important to note that some terms that have been avoided for so many years, like free power and informed consent and proper resourcing of Indigenous representative organisations and capacity building for First Nations empowerment and better resourcing are all on the table. These are all very positive things. And as we've just heard, um, some of the scepticism 
around the Savannah burning methodology um, have really, you know, have really been addressed by the Chubb review. Um, there might be issues around additionality and integrity, but they certainly don't apply to the Savannah burning method. So all those things sound terrific. It's almost a recognition that if Australia is to decarbonise and protect biodiversity, Australia will need the help of First Nations peoples and their lands. Their lands that now extend under land right and native title laws to 52% of Australia. Possibly 65% when an existing 100 registered native title claims have been heard. Today, 60% of remote Australia is under some form of Indigenous title, and that could increase to up to 75%. So some of the possibilities that this opens up has been highlighted. And uh, Jenny's already noted this in some excellent work that ISIN's done, mapping opportunities for Indigenous carbon. And, and those opportunities could really be there for the picking alongside the expansion of those 81 IPAs to maybe 100 plus IPAs. Not 50% of the National Reserve System, but 70%. Uh, but uh, there are always uh, downsides. There are always buts. So let me uh, just uh, outline some of them. First Nations peoples in remote Australia are extraordinarily poor. According to the latest census, only three in 10 First Nations adults are employed. Over 50% live below the poverty line. The gaps in remote Australia are widening. And governments, Commonwealth and state and territories won't commit to funding shortfalls, outstations, homelands, housing, health, energy security, food security. Next, 50% of the National Reserve System is currently managed by less than 900 full-time equivalent rangers. The government is committed to doubling those numbers, but it's not quite clear when. But currently, we're seeing 850,000 square kilometres managed by a handful of positions per Indigenous protected area. Yeah, this is just extraordinary how few funded positions there are to manage such vast tracts of country. Next, when we look at the carbon market, we, found, we find that the government is looking to fund carbon abatement and sequestration increasingly by big business and philanthropy, not by the government beyond its current commitments to the Emissions Reduction Fund. And now, as we've just heard, the government is looking for a nature to develop a nature repair market, a biodiversity market, the commodification of biodiversity to fund biodiversity conservation, not from the government, but by big business and philanthropy. The Commonwealth Environment Minister, Tanya Plebisek, says the Commonwealth cannot afford the estimated 1 billion to 10 billion, it's a wide range, per annum required to restore biodiversity. But Australia can afford $11 billion per annum subsidy to fossil fuels and $20 billion per annum proposed 
in stage three tax cuts from 2024. Even the very positive independent review of ACCUs has had unintended consequences of delaying the adoption of the sequestration method that could increase the value of Indigenous carbon projects three times. That is by literally millions of dollars. Carbon projects are good for decarbonisation. They're good for biodiversity, as we heard time and again yesterday, but they are still underfunded. So, what to do about this? What to do about addressing uh, the good things and the bad things? How can we get Australia to recognise and accept that decarbonisation um, will not happen without First Nations lands and peoples? To decarbonise, we as a nation need to decolonise. What does this mean in practice? Well, we need to campaign for proper recognition of First Nation people's efforts, mainly in remote Australia, under extraordinarily difficult conditions. We need to devolve power to landowners and fund them properly for the work that they do. Again, to emphasise under extraordinarily difficult remote circumstances. At the moment, in my view, First Nations people are in a very powerful position in remote Australia. ISIN is a potentially powerful carbon sector voice. ISIN needs to join up with the caring for country voice of um, movements like Country Needs People and others. And it needs to join up with the clean energy voice of the First Nations Clean Energy Network and others. And it needs to join up with the First Nations Heritage Alliance voice. Australia has awakened from a decade of sleep on the climate and biodiversity crisis. Now we need to hurry up. First Nations peoples and their allies need to fight fire with fire. They need to politically mobilise to hold the new government to account for its commitments, starting with the May 2023 budget, just three months away. We cannot, as a nation, go back to sleep. 2013 is not far, sorry, 2030 is not far away. Thank you.